Exodus chapter 13, week 21 in Exodus. Took us 20 weeks to get out of Egypt, but we're out. We have made it out of Egypt. Let's pray again. Ask the Lord to bless our time in the Word. Father, we are so grateful for the power, the sureness, the truth of Your Word. And I am so thankful that when a man approaches this pulpit, Lord, You don't ask me, just a man, nobody, to come here alone, but Lord, it is by the power of Your Holy Spirit and the calling of Your Spirit that You would have anyone speak Your Word. And so, Lord, I am desperate for You to show up and speak. Lord, we did not come to hear from Adam. We came to hear from You. And we need You to speak by Your Holy Spirit through Your Holy Word. Each one of us filled with Your Spirit, Lord, we want to hear from You. And you have something that you want to speak to each one of us individually, Lord. We, we've come with difficulties and problems and challenges and, and uniquely to us. And you have something in your word for us individually. And I pray that, Lord, we would be willing to hear what you have for us. So I pray for each person here this morning that you would steady their mind and their hearts, that they would be able to receive what you have for them. And then, Lord, I pray corporately as a church, there are things that you want us collectively as your body to hear from you this morning. I pray that we would receive that. Lord, and you are so faithful. If we will sit at your feet, you will minister to us. You never leave us dry. You always give us what we need. Because you are a good, good Father. You are faithful. And so we trust you this morning. We have come to your house to be fed by you, to hear from you, to worship you. And Lord, we are expecting because you are faithful. So we trust you for that. And, and we worship you knowing that you will do it, Lord. We worship you ahead of time because we know that you will do it. And we thank you for it ahead of time because we know that you will do it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it great that we can thank God for things before He's already done it because we know He's going to do it? Isn't that an amazing thing? I love that. I love that. So we're out of Egypt. How did we get here? Ten plagues. Some pretty insane stuff, a really stubborn pharaoh, a lot of light giving, a God that was willing to give a lot of light, to give a lot of opportunity to a man who, and to a people who were entirely unwilling to repent. And at some point after, well after six hardenings, God hardened Pharaoh's heart as well as his servants' hearts. But the people, and especially Moses, there was an, a transformation in Moses where at the beginning they kind of went off track, but after that you just saw obedience. And you saw faith. And you saw a movement in Moses where he was on track. And he was doing things without knowing what was coming right up to the, to the very end where God's like, yep, next one we're leaving. And, and you realize, wait a second, he didn't know what was coming next. At this point, he is absolutely moving by faith. And, and you could have missed it by then. You, you really could have missed it. But right there, right up to, the, to that point where he's like, hey, this next one, this is the one you're leaving at. And you realize that Moses has been completely operating. I mean, even though he's talking to God moment by moment, it's faith because God's not telling him the, 
the plan. He's just telling him the next step. And that's so cool. Because that's faith. And there's been all this light and all this movement, all this growth in Moses, but there's been all this darkness and all this, well, plagues on Egypt and on Pharaoh. And finally, the firstborn death plague. But to the people of Israel, and and actually to anyone that would obey, right? Because there's a mixed multitude that came out. There was blood. There was sacrifice. There was the, the lamb. There was the Passover. If you would obey God by faith, if you would obey, if you would listen to God's words and you would believe by faith and you would do what He said to do, if you would take that lamb, that innocent lamb, and you would, you would kill it. And you would spill its blood. And you would put it on the doorpost. And then you would stay, remain in the house. Remain within the protection of the blood. The angel of death, when it came, God would not allow it to touch you. But it would pass over. There was sure death if not for the blood. Sure as anything was ever sure, you would lose your firstborn to this angel of death. Judgment was coming to every single house in Egypt if it were not for the blood. Only thing that would would escape death was the blood. And so those that obeyed God, those that by faith applied the blood escaped the judgment, escaped the death. And now, after this event, Pharaoh sends his servants and he says, get out. He drives them out. Get out. And just as they had been instructed, they had plundered the Egyptians. And they didn't just leave, but they leave with all of their gold and all of their riches. And they went out. And as they went out, God had given them some instructions. And we had, we had seen that there was, previous to this, there was the, the unleavened movement of repentance. Remember, we had seen all of that. But now they're out. They have left Egypt. How did they leave? How did they leave Egypt being a picture of the world They have come out of the world. They have come out of the world. They have have come out how? Through the blood. Through the sacrifice. Right? Remember, we've, we've talked about this whole journey. The journey of light being given, responding to that light. Faith being built, responding to that faith. God teaching. God drawing. Finally, God giving the gospel message, responding to that gospel message by faith and blood being applied, remaining in Christ, judgment being passed over, and now coming out of the world. It is a picture of being saved. And here now they are brought out of the world, a picture of being saved. Amen? You see the picture? It's so beautiful. And now they are out. They're out of Egypt by the blood of Christ, by the obedience of faith, by the application of the blood of Christ. They are now out of Egypt. And this is what the Lord says to them. Chapter 13, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Consecrate. You know, I didn't talk to Job, but when he came up and said there's three C's, and he said, Consecrate, I was like, What? That was so cool. I didn't, we had no conversation. That was just super cool. You have to have a consecrated life, he said. It's like, dude, dude, were you reading Exodus ahead of time? Were you sneak peeking? He says, consecrate. This word means set apart. Set apart as holy. 
set apart for religious service. That's what this word means. Set apart. It is the Old Testament word for be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Right? That's what this picture is here. That's what this word means. Consecrate, he says, to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. What are the Old Testament, all the things they do in the Old Testament, what are those designed for? Foreshadows, pictures of what? Of Christ. And of the Christian life. Of what God has, was going to do and what God has now done. Right? That is what this is. He says, and then they've just gotten out. They haven't even crossed the Red Sea yet. They have just gotten out and he's already given them instructions. And the first thing he says to them, consecrate. Okay, this is a picture of being saved. It's the first thing I should say to a new believer. Consecrate. It's the first instructions to a new believer. Consecrate. Be ye holy. Be ye set apart. Be different. Do I say that to an unbeliever? No, I, I would never talk to an unbeliever like that. Be ye holy, unbeliever. They have no power. They have no ability. I'm trying to make an unbeliever righteous. That is the wrong conversation. No. You need blood. You need, you need, I need to help them come to faith in Christ and apply the blood and then come out of Egypt. And now we talk about consecrate. Consecrate. Now, we're going to get more explanation of this after we talk about the next instructions. So I'm going to push pause, okay? And we're going to stay in text because I always get off track when I go out of text, okay? So I'm going to let the text be my notes. Look at verse 3. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. Who brought them out? Who? The Lord brought right out of the gate. One of the things about new believers is when you start seeing things change, it's real easy to start thinking you're doing it. As a matter of fact, that happens to old believers too. As a matter of fact, that happens to every Christian along the way at any given time. Let's all remember who's doing it, who did it, and how you got here. The Lord did it. You didn't do it. You're not doing it, and you're not going to do it. You didn't do it, you can't do it, you won't do it, and the next step isn't you. The Lord did it with His strong hand. He is the one that has saved you, and He is the one that is going to continue to save you. And He is the one that's going to continue to change you. And He is the one that has done all of the change in you. Amen? The Lord, by His strong hand, has brought you out of Egypt. Oh, foolish Galatians! Starting, you know, He who, you started this thing in the Spirit, you're now going to perfect it in the flesh? That is the exact same conversation. Remember, the Lord brought you out by His strong hand. And the very next thing He says is, no leavened bread shall be eaten. And that's the balance. Right? Right there. Remember that God has brought you out of Egypt. Don't sin. Leaven is always a picture of sin in the Bible, guys. So in the very next breath, don't sin. And, and you go, wait a second, the Lord brought me out, but I'm now commanded to not sin. Exactly. Exactly. Because you've got to actually still, you have a free will. Are you a robot? Did any one of you become a robot? Do you still make choices? Or do you feel like you've stopped making choices? Let me ask you this. 
If you walk out this door and decide to not make any choices anymore, how's that going to go? Yeah, right, exactly. You just made a choice. You just chose to not make any choices. Oxymoron. No, it's true. Thank you. I totally didn't catch that, so... <laughs> If you go out and choose to not make any choices, you just made a choice. Duh. Burp, 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 burp. It's like Charlie, Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Duh. You did not, you, you know, you do not become a robot when you are saved. You weren't a robot before. You're not a robot now. You continue to make choices. If anything, if, and this is true, now as a born-again believer in Christ, you have more freedom, not less. You make more choices because you're not a slave to sin. The unbeliever is actually a slave to sin. You are not. But God did not make you incapable of sinning now. If that was the case, then it would be real easy to determine a person's salvation. They would be incapable of sinning. We would just look for the person that can't sin and be like, well, that guy's saved. And if that is the mark of a saved person, I've never met a saved person ever. And I am not saved. <laughs> right? Are any of you saved, if that's the case? If you're honest, you're not, right? Then that's not the mark of a saved person, because we all continue, as much as we try not to, as much as we don't want to, we continue to sin. Hopefully less and less and less. Hopefully less grievous sins. But nonetheless, we fight the fight. So he says, he reminds them, I brought you out of the house of bondage. What bondage? The spiritual bondage would be the bondage of sin in Egypt. The literal bondage is, I mean, they were slaves there, right? The picture is the spiritual bondage of sin. Um, by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened br uh, bread shall be eaten. Stop sinning. The, in, in, in 2 Timothy, and these verses have just been ministering to me over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Paul tells Timothy, you know, and I'm paraphrasing to some degree, the firm foundation of the Lord stands on these two things. Number one, the Lord knows whom, who, who are His. The Lord knows those who are His. God is aware of, of who are saved and not. He knows whose are His. But number two, let all those who call on the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So if someone is naming the name of Christ, I think we spend a little bit too much time trying to determine whether that person's saved or not. Hmm, are you saved or not? The Lord knows who are his. Here's my job. I need to encourage them to be consecrated unto the Lord to depart from iniquity. That would be my responsibility. I need to encourage them. If you're naming the name of Christ, then let me show you what the Bible says about sin in your life. You should run from it. You should depart from it. You shouldn't have anything to do with it. That, that's, that's the point. And if you say yes and amen probably a good chance you're a Christian. Not that you don't sin anymore, but your attitude towards sin should agree with that. Right? Christian, right? If Christian, if you could if you could rip sin out of your life and never do it again, would you? <laughs> yeah. Every true believer says yes and amen. Every true believer reads Romans 7 and goes, yeah? In Romans 8, you go, yeah? You know, we're just like right there with Paul on the edge of our seat. I'm so there, Paul. I'm right with you. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? And then we get to 8, and we're like, victory, 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 you know? We're right there. 
And then we, 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 and then we walk out the door and we're like, oh, I just blew it again. <laughs> you know, but, but we get it. So this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread that he's establishing here. And this is the only time that it's established to this degree. He, he referen- references it in the law later, but he references back to this point. So, I mean, they're literally marching out of Egypt and he's already establishing a feast and, and law. And this is, the, this is actually the primary establishment of this feast and, and law right here. There's only references made to this later. Um, verse 4, On this day you are going out in, in the month of Abib, Verse 5, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, uh, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. This is the establishment of a feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which precedes the Passover, right? So you're going to do this leading up to the Passover. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. This is a feast that he is establishing that will precede the Passover. But the positioning that it has here in our, in our um, picture of being saved very much gives us a picture of the being saved post-salvation, now walk in holiness. It's so amazing how the Word of God works. Because it's an odd place to put this, right? I would have thought I would have found this later on established in the giving of the law. But it's right here, like, we're marching out, man. We're tired, we're beat, this whole thing. And like, hey, let me tell you about this first feast right now. Like, right now? Okay, it's a little weird timing. It's not. Because it fits the narrative of being saved. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, verse 6. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you. How serious does that sound? The New Testament says... The New Testament gives the idea that if something even looks like sin, we should refrain from it. Do you you understand that? If something even looks like sin, we should refrain from it for witness sake. Because if someone sees me doing that and gets the wrong idea and then that impacts negatively my Lord Jesus Christ and my witness for Him, that should matter to me. That should should be a concern to me. We're not talking about salvation here. We're not talking about whether I'm saved or not. We're talking about my ability to be of service to my King. We're talking about my witness for him. Right? We're talking about that. And here he says, And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. We should be able to go into each other's homes and walk around freely. And oh, no, 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 can't go in that room. Uh, you're quickly shutting doors. Don't open the fridge. Don't go in the basement. Listen, if I just popped into your house, if I just showed up unannounced on any given day, how'd you feel about it? If you knew, and listen, it shouldn't be a big deal. I'm not putting any, anything on, on me. There's a title that the, that the church gives, that God gives the pastor. It's called bishop. 
Look that one up on your own free time. If I was just to show up at your house any given day, just to show up and ask you for a tour, is there any room, any area of your house that you wouldn't want to show me? I'm nobody. Take it a step up. Jesus shows up to your house. Is there anywhere you wouldn't want to show him? The reality is Jesus is with you all the time in those rooms. He is already there. Our houses should be holy places. They should be holy places. One of the things that is so important to me and should be so important to you is that the person you see here in this church or in the grocery store is the same person you would see at home. I used to travel for work and I strived to make sure that when I was with a customer or in a hotel room or in an airplane or in my car, my wife was, was, could be positive that it was the same person that, was, that would be in the bedroom with her at home or the couch with her at home or at the dinner table with her at home, that I was the same person. I, I, I worked, and, and, and it's not me, it's, it's Jesus in me that would allow that. Amen? Because it was by his strong and mighty hand that I came out of Egypt. Amen? It shall be as a sign. No, no, no. I skipped. Verse 8. And you shall... No, no. Mm, did I skip again? Yeah. And you shall tell your son, verse 8, in that day, saying... And here's the reason, too. It's witness. It's testimony. You shall tell your son in that day. You wouldn't stop there, but this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and on a, and a memorial between your eyes that the Lord, uh, Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep his ordinance in its season from this uh, from year to year. Now the firstborn. See, he paused and then he got back to it here. Verse 11. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives it to you, that you shall set apart. Same, that's the idea. Consecrate. You shall set apart. You shall you shall set apart as holy for the service of the Lord. All that open the womb, every, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the male shall be the Lord's. But the firstborn of a donkey, poor donkeys, you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. I don't understand that one. I'm going to just move on. And all the firstborn of of man among your sons, you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come. Again, this is a testimony. When, when your kids, 200 years later, hey, why do we do this? I'm so glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked that question. Because the Lord, by a mighty hand, redeemed us out of Egypt. Pharaoh would not release us. And after ten, nine plagues, God sent a tenth plague of death upon the firstborn. But blood, by the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts, we believed God for it and the angel of death passed over and God would not allow him to touch us. And he by the strong hand of the Lord, brought us out of Egypt, and so we dedicate the firstborn to the Lord. And they would tell the story. Of course, I don't think they fully understood, you know, the mystery of the Gospel had not been fully revealed to them. And now we look back on this in, in just awe and majesty because Jesus, the firstborn, has come. And His blood has been shed. 
and all who believe upon his name, the death passes over and the judgment passes over. And we come out of this world. And the Lord says to us, be holy. And then the Lord says to us, be consecrated. See, first He says, be holy. And then here He says, be consecrated. And it's, it's the firstborn here, but the picture is for all of us. If you are a child of God, if you have applied the blood, if you have come out of Egypt, if you have come out of this world, then the Lord is calling you to these two things. He is calling you to be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. And He is calling you to a consecrated life, set apart for His service. We are supposed to be different. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Is it not our reasonable service to consecrate our lives unto the Lord? To give Him my life? And what does that mean? Does that mean that I can't have fun anymore? I think a lot of times people think that. I really do. I think that people think, well... Preachers mean it. I can't have fun anymore. I guess my life's over. i got to consecrate it to the Lord. If that's your understanding of serving Jesus, I'm really sorry that someone put that idea into your head. I have never lived more since the day that, that, that I started really living for Jesus. Every day with Him has been a greater day still. Every day lived with Him is a greater day still. Do you know how excited I was to get back here to serve Him at this pulpit and at this church? Living for Him is life. Submission to Him is freedom. Being with Him Oh, to know Him and to walk with Him and to love Him and to be loved by Him. No, that's why you were created. To be purposeless. Or to be created for a purpose and to not walk in that purpose. And that is why so many people are walking around feeling empty. Do you notice that most people you meet seem to look and feel and act empty? Is that a good description of how most people kind of are? I mean, I mean, they're just empty. And the world is seriously trying to do that to them. Sucking them dry of anything left. Jesus came to give us life, he says, and that more abundant. There's nothing empty and nothing sad and dull and lacking in following Christ with your whole life. Certainly not boring. It's the most fulfilling thing you could possibly do. And let us not forget that this life, this isn't even the real one. This is the short and futile one that we're not even supposed to be Truly living for. This is the short-ended one. Everything I do here 
is truly just for what I gain there, why not spend it all here on what I can gain there and only what I do here for Him earns me anything there consecrated unto Jesus. Amen? Well, what does that look like? It's actually fairly simple. I've said it to you 150 times already. Regularly get into His Word because that's where He speaks to you. And then whatever He says to do, do it. I know. Super crazy. It's that simple. Get close to Jesus and then just like do what He says to do. It's called relationship. Jesus wants for you to follow Him. And when He says, yep, that's sin... Submit it to Him. Confess, agree, yep, that's sin. Submit it to Him. When He says, I want you to go here, go there. I want you to talk to that person, go talk to that person. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like literally that simple. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. I mean, like you tend to obey it easier, but sometimes He tells you to like climb bigger things and walk harder roads. I'll be honest with you. You know, some of you are like, yo. But then he, he, he builds you up. He prepares you for it. It's not boring. I could promise you it's not boring. It's fantastic. It's amazing. Okay, before I keep drudging on there, let's keep going. <sighs> So it will be when your son asks, verse 14, in time to come, saying, What is this that you shall say to him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Again, this is like the third time he's reminded us. Who brought us out of Egypt? Who? The Lord Jesus brought us out of Egypt. How did he do it? By strength of hand. And it came to pass, verse 15, When Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb. But all the firstborn of my sons, I redeem. Amen. It shall be as a sign on your hand and as as frontlets between your eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out. All right. Verse 17. Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Now, I, I've been, uh, I had a lot of, like I had two weeks to kind of soak in these passages. And I spent a lot of time looking at maps. And it didn't help me that much. I'll be honest with you. There's guys who study the the potential paths that the guys took, especially when you're trying to find where the Red Sea is, which maybe we'll get to this morning, maybe we won't. Um, And like, which, because there's all kinds of conjecture. Like, this was a possible path. This is a possible path. Maybe the Red Sea was here. Maybe the Red Sea was here. Maybe this is where the crossing was. Lots of possible, you know, ideas. Uh, but But some of the places named by God here we're not sure where those places are. Um, But we kind of know where they didn't go because we do know where they ended up. Get what I'm saying? Like we know where probably Mount Sinai was and we know where the promised land is and so we know where they probably didn't go. Um, Long story short, uh, uh, they they couldn't have gone very far because this wasn't very far in the journey. And God God didn't take them 
through where we think the Philistines were right now, which, which wasn't a huge group yet, okay? But they were much larger than what Israel obviously could have tackled at this point. Makes sense? Big pagan army. Big pagan army. And he says, he didn't want to take them through this big pagan army at this point, because if they saw war, they might be tempted to run back to Egypt. One of the things that I think we could glean from this is something that's encouraged in the New Testament, and that is not to take a novice, a new believer, and throw them into battle too soon. And we see this happen, especially when the new believer comes with a popular name. Someone who gets saved that is, has name recognition. You know, like a, 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 like a Hollywood guy or you know, some, some famous guy or whatever. They get saved and then they're like, let's put this guy on stage next week and have him start telling him his story and, and, and tour this guy, you know, because he got saved and everybody needs to hear his story. And then like six months later, you hear about this guy, he's totally backslidden and, and off the rails, you know what I mean? And it's like, well, that was a bad idea. You, you threw him into the battle. Or, you know, a young, a young man gets saved and and he goes to Bible study, and he's super excited, and, and everybody hears him speaking in the, in the Bible study about his super excitedness, and, and he's, he's sharing some really awesome stuff, and someone grabs him and he says, you should be a pastor. And all of a sudden, they're throwing him into Bible studies and trying to get him to speak. Whoa, cool your jets, Turbo. I, I, Paul was... Highly trained. He knew the scriptures. And yet God took him for a four-year sabbatical before he even entered, really entered the ministry. We need to be thoughtful and cautious. Now we want to also recognize what God is doing and not hold a person back longer than God wants to hold them back. I think sometimes we also do that, you know, and I don't know, we just need to be spirit-led in it, is what it really boils down to. Just because a person is young doesn't mean that God can't also use them. I think there are some young men that are strong in the spirit and that are ready to go, that God is ready to send them out and the church is like, nah, you're too young. What? I don't. No, I don't agree with you. If God has prepared that man and he is ready to go, then you send him out. Amen? But if someone just got saved last week, I don't think we send him into war. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think, we, I think there's a discipling time and a, and a time to build him up and, and, and strengthen him. And, and God right here says, ah, we're not going to send them straight into war. Right? They need, they need some time here. So I thought that was interesting. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, uh, visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. What a man of faith Joseph was. He believed. He knew. He was so sure. God is going to keep His promises. We are not staying here. And when He does, you take me out of here. And you would think that Joseph would have had a real love for Egypt, you know? And I'm sure he did. But he's like, nope. Nope, you take me out of here when God brings you out. 400 years later, or whatever it was, you know, the exact number, give or take. 400 years later, they kept that promise. 
I wonder who had his bones all those years. You know, like what house they were in. All right, Joseph, it's time to go, buddy. That would have been weird. So they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by the day in a pillar of cloud, a part of, yeah, pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Oh my word, when I read that, I had to do a double take. Now you've read this before, right? You've read that, think about what this is. For however long that this whole uh, plague thing's been going on, and, and I'm not sure, I, I didn't try to figure it out, but it's been a while. They've been seeing some crazy stuff. So maybe for them, at this point, this isn't tripping them out as much as it would trip you and me out. Right? For what they've seen, maybe they're like, yeah, there's a pillar of fire. I mean, what we've seen at this point, it's like, yep, that's pretty crazy. But I know we'd be like, dude, there's a giant pillar of fire leading us. And now there's a giant pillar of smoke leading us. But this was the presence of God staying with them. And, and here's what this says. He never leaves them. Now, now, when I first read this, I had to go check. Did he never leave them during the entire time in the wilderness? Is that what this is saying? And you know what? That is what this is saying. And here's how I know. If you go to the end of Exodus, chapter 40, and you pick up in, actually in verse 38, the very last verse of Exodus. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. For 40 years. Now listen, Christian. There is an appropriate time of wilderness wandering. They actually had a time between the, uh, the, the splitting and crossing of the Red Sea and the coming to the Jordan, which is a wilderness wandering that was appropriate. It was God-led and it was right. And we have a time of wilderness wandering in our early Christian faith that is a faith-building time. Jesus, after being baptized, after the Holy Spirit coming upon Him, what did God do with Him? He sent Him into the wilderness to be tested. There is a time where our faith is tested. And it is an appropriate, it is a right time. The Lord does that in our life. But the next 40 years, that was, that was a inappropriate, that was the wrong time. They were not supposed to be there. That was built and born of rebellion. Now, did God know that was going to happen? Does God use that for all kinds of pictures and types? And was it part of his plan? Of course. God, God knew this was going to happen. He, he foreordained all kinds of types and pictures in it. And that's the whole nosebleed thing where man's free will and rebellion caused 40 years of wilderness wandering. God's predestined, foreordained plan always purposed it anyways. And you can wrestle that out in your mind and struggle with that yourself. I'm fine with it. They both exist. Totally fine. Right? But the fact is that the 40 years was illegitimate. 
There was a legitimate wilderness wandering, and there was an illegitimate wilderness wandering. Okay? Ow, that's really, really hot. (laughs) Don't touch that. But here's the crazy thing. God never left them. His presence never left them. You would think, you knew he never left them, right? I mean, he was working with them, judging them, speaking to them, giving them the law, speaking through Moses. There was the tabernacle. You knew the Shekinah glory was in the tabernacle. You knew they were sacrificing. You knew that he was providing. You knew that there was all kinds of stuff going on in the wilderness. But did you ever stop to realize that the actual pillar of fire and pillar of smoke was present every single day the entire 40 years of wandering? That everywhere they went, the pillar of smoke would lead them to the next place or the pillar of fire would lead them to the next? Did you ever stop to think that? The grace of God. They're in the wilderness wandering an illegitimate time. Do you know that Christians today can wander their entire Christian life illegitimate wandering of just complete lack of victory, a complete lack of of God's victory in their life, living a life that God would not have them live, doing and being the kind of person God would not have them be. We're not talking about salvation because the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke is still there. But they're not where they're supposed to be. That's why 2 Timothy is so important. The Lord knows who are His. But if that person comes to me and says, I confess Christ, and their life is all kinds of wonky, what am I going to say to them? All right, depart from iniquity. That's my responsibility. Well, am I saved? I don't know. We're called to not judge, guys. That's why I don't judge. Because I don't know. If they've confessed Christ, I don't know. But if there's no holiness, if they have not consecrated, I don't have anything I can judge it on. I don't know. I would have to put the ball back in their court. I don't know. Do you know? Well, I, I, I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome. Then, then let's deal with the sin in your life and consecrate your life unto the Lord. Well, I don't want to do that. Then I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Do you know? Are you saved? Well, I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great. Well, then let's deal with the sin in your life. Well, I don't want to do that. Then I don't know. I mean, we would just go round and round and round. And it would frustrate you, and I can't help you. But but the Lord never left them. The Lord never left them. What grace, what mercy, what an amazing picture of the love and mercy and grace of our God. That really struck me. Did that strike you? I I didn't realize that. And I know I've read it, and I'm sure I've been told it. And I'm sure I even knew it. (laughs) You know, sometimes things just strike you, and I don't know if you're like me, but I'm just like, woo, that's crazy. I really, really, really wanted to get into 14, but that's what we got this morning. Chapter 13. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the time in your word. I know I was pretty jazzed to be back here. I'm so thankful for your Holy Spirit. You have made so many promises in your word that as a child of God, when we have come into relationship with you, being washed by the blood, being forgiven of our sins by faith, by grace, being adopted as your child, that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. Just as you were were faithful to the children of Israel and you led them by night as a pillar of fire and you led them by day as a pillar of cloud, You continue to lead us, Lord. I do pray if there's anyone here 
that's been wandering in the wilderness, Lord. This continued illegitimately wandering. And has heard this morning the need for holiness to get the leaven out and the need for consecration to set apart their life for you. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would bring them out of the wilderness back into your loving arms. Bring them to repentance. Restore a right spirit in their life. Heal them, Lord. Comfort them. Encourage them. Strengthen them. Speak to them even now, Father. Build them up in the most holy faith. Do a great work in their lives, even right now, Father. And for, uh, for everyone, Lord, that has been walking, but maybe, Lord, could, could tighten the belt, could deal with some things. And the reality is that's every one of us. That's every single one of us. Lord, you could touch something in every one of our lives that, Father, we could submit to you and be better off for it. There is something in every one of our lives that we could confess to you and be better off for it. That you could take, that you could heal, that you could work, that could allow us to be a, a stronger, more useful vessel and witness in your hands. Lord, help us to not resist you, but to allow you to work that in our hearts and in our lives this morning. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us to submit and, and allow you to work in our hearts. You are so faithful and loving and kind. And we want to be all in for you. Jesus, thank you for your blood shed for our sins. I pray for this church. I pray that you would continue to build us up in the faith. Help us to be your people, useful for you. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.